Now here's where we get to some really incredibly useful charge distributions. Uh, so the first one we're going to look at is a finite plane of positive charge. So this is a finite non-conducting plane of positive charge uh, viewed from the side. So if this was our plane, you're looking at it kind of like that. Um, so you can see that uh, the field lines obviously go away from these positively char positive charges. And uh, here in the middle, in the middle of this thing, it's kind of uniform. In other words, they, these tend to be like, look like they're parallel and they point perpendicular to this uh, flat plane. Same over here. When you get out to the edges, you can see the field uh, is not so uniform and obviously it pushes away from these things. So the field lines tend to spread out. Field vectors, uh, same kind of thing. You can see how that all works. Now, an interesting thing happens if we have an infinite conducting or non-conducting plane. I'm using non-conducting to start with. If you have an infinite plane, notice that uh, it is somewhat of a conceit of the idea of an infinite plane, but this is not the end of this thing. Uh, this goes on forever. So in other words, uh, this plane goes on forever that way. This is not a field line. This is just showing that the this plate goes on forever that way and that way. Let me get rid of those so we don't get confused on that. But in this situation, these lines never get any farther away from each other. Uh, because of the infinite nature of this, these are always parallel. So this creates what we call a uniform field. Okay, uh, If you have an infinite plane of uh, positive charge, we're making it non-conducting, uh, as you'll see why in a minute. Uh, it's a uniform field. It's a uniform field up here. It just means that it's all in the same direction and it's all the same magnitude everywhere. These lines do not get any farther or closer to each other. These lines do not get any farther or closer. So this creates a uniform field. Uh, depicting that in the field vector manner is about the same. You can see that the length of all these vectors is the same everywhere. And they're all in the same direction. They all point upward on this side. They all point downward over here on this side. Uh, they, an infinite plane creates a uniform field. Now you may ask, well, we can never have an infinite plane. Why would we want to even know this? Uh, you can actually create this field here on Earth, and we do it all the time. In fact, every capacitor has a field similar to this. Uh, how do you do it without an infinite plane? We'll see momentarily. Uh, but uh, using the idea of an infinite plane uh, actually helps us out a lot because we can uh, just assume, like here on the surface of the Earth, you look all the way to the left, you look all the way to the right, it looks like it goes on forever. So an infinite plane is a good model for a really large plane, or if you're only looking at a very limited area of a finite plane, uh, modeling it as an infinite plane, as long as like if we were just sticking in this area right here, we're not going to look beyond this section right here, uh, I'm going to go back up to this. If we were only looking at this part right here, it looks very much like the field due to an infinite plane if we just stick to that region right there. So modeling infinite planes can be helpful. Now, uh, particularly useful are the equations for fields near the charge surfaces of a conductor or non-conductor uh, with what we call surface charge density sigma. Now, with uh, especially with conductors, although we can do it with insulators as well, uh, it's more common to have the charge distributed across a surface area A. For example, if I just rub this with my shirt right here, uh, this becomes charged only on this surface, not on the back or the sides, just on a surface. So when we're doing uh, talking about stuff like that, Q distributed over an area A, we use sigma. Sigma is the surface charge density, Q divided by A. That's a sigma right there, lowercase sigma. Uh, the electric field next to a charged non-conducting surface that has surface charge density sigma, again, sigma will be measured in coulombs per square meter. The electric field is sigma over 2 epsilon naught. There's our, our, two, our epsilon naught, our fundamental constant there again sigma over 2 epsilon naught. In contrast, the field 
next to a conducting surface, which is in electrostatic equilibrium. It's got to be in electrostatic equilibrium for this to be true. Otherwise, I mean, the charges could be anywhere in the thing. Uh, they'll all be on the surface if it's an electrostatic equilibrium. Uh, and it's got surface charge density sigma. The electric field in this situation is twice as large. Now you may say, what is this? Why is it twice as large for a conductor? I will show you. And the difference can be explained using field lines. You can also use uh, field vectors. I prefer the field line explanation. Um, and it, this will explain why this is twice as much next to a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium than it is next to a, a non-conductor with the same surface charge density. It's twice as much for a conductor. You'll see why. And what's cool about this, it also shows that within the conductor in electrostatic equilibrium, the electric field must be zero uh, within the substance of the conductor. This demo shows both of those things. So what we have here is an infinite conducting slab, and I've made it infinite. In other words, it goes you know, along that way forever and along that way forever. I'm not going to keep those arrows in there, uh, even though it goes that way forever because I don't want them to be confused with field lines. Uh, but the, um, these are infinite, and that simplifies the analysis quite a bit just to make them infinite. This is a conducting slab, and this is a non-conducting slab. So what we're going to be doing in this little uh, field line drawing is we're going to be uh, both which are viewed from the side. We're assuming they have the same surface charge density sigma. Uh, that means that, you know, here's what we're looking at, like as we're looking at from the side of this thing. They both have the same amount of charge per unit area. Uh, so same amount of charge per square meter on each of these things. And we're going to set the scale. Uh, so that each plus sign represents one nanocoulomb, and each one of those is going to give off two field lines. So let's go ahead and just draw these, and let's just say, let's put eight on each one of these. Now, there's something wrong with this picture, though. This, on the left, is a conductor, conducting slab. This is a non-conducting slab. Something is wrong with the way I've drawn this conducting slab, simply because this is a conductor. Chargers can move wherever they want to move in this thing. So they would not be happy just staying here on top. There's all this room on the bottom that they could spread out onto. And on a conductor, they will. On a non-conductor, like this foam pad here, I can go ahead and charge this with you know, my shirt, and all the chargers are staying on the top here. They won't migrate to the bottom. For my conductor, they will migrate to the bottom. So what I'm going to do is take half of these out, put them on the bottom, so turns out if I want to have the same surface charge density sigma on this one and sigma on this one, I've got to put more charge really on my conductor. In fact, twice as much charge. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, now I've got the same surface charge density on the top as the bottom. Bottom line is if you want sigma on the top on a conductor, there has to be sigma surface charge density on the bottom too. Uh, not true for the the non-conductor, and this kind of gives give, gives it away why the field is stronger here, because there's more charge on this conducting slab to get the same surface charge density. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the field line. So for each of these positive signs, which I'm assigning arbitrarily one nanocoulomb, they each give off two field lines. So let's go ahead and do this here. This one gives off a field line up and a field line down, and then this one gives off a field line up. I'm just going to move this charge over a little bit so the field lines don't run into each other. Field line up, field line down. This one is a field line, I'm going to start from there, up and a field line down. This one, I'm going to start from there, has a field line up and a field line down. And we can just keep playing this game. On this side, similarly, one field line up, one field line down for every nanocoulomb. Now we notice a couple really important things. Look at the right in here, look at the field line density right in here. Notice that it's twice as strong as the field line density here. The field is twice as strong here. And so in fact, let's go ahead and write this in. E equals sigma over epsilon naught. 
on both the top and the bottom, although they, they uh, uh, point in different directions. Here, there's half as many field lines. E is equal to sigma over 2 epsilon naught. It's half the field strength. And another interesting thing that this shows us is that inside here, notice that this field line points down, this one points up, down, up, down, up. What is the field strength inside the substance of the conductor? This isn't hollow. This is all metal in here. What's the field strength in here? These charges are evenly distributed on top and the bottom. I've just kind of offset them a little bit so I can draw the lines. But the field inside here is exactly zero. It totally cancels inside here. So we get within the substance of the conductor, this is not hollow, this is solid metal in here, we get the fact that E equals zero inside there for a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. So the reason it's stronger for a conductor is that you have to have twice as many much charge to get uh, the same surface charge density. Uh, so that's why it's twice as strong. Inside the conductor, the field is zero, as long as it's in electrostatic equilibrium. Not so inside our non-conductor. There can be a non-zero field in there.